All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're turning, welcome back. Please subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Lucy wants to lose 15 pounds over the next two months. She knows that dieting and working out will work, but it will require effort. She also knows there is an experimental intervention that she saw on social media that is available, but the efficacy is unclear. Lucy decides to diet and work out, which demonstrates what. Now, we're looking at Lucy's behavior. She makes the decision to diet and work out. She wants to lose 15 pounds. And why does she decide that? Well, she knows it's going to work. So Lucy's being very practical. She's making a practical decision about what she knows to be effective. Because there's also an experimental intervention she saw on social media, but it does, but the efficacy or the effectiveness isn't clear. So Lucy simply says, I'm going to go make the practical decision and I'm going to diet and work out to lose 15 pounds. What does that demonstrate? A, parsimony. Now, parsimony has to go with the simplest explanation, right? And this isn't really about how simple the explanation is. It's just more about practicality. Lucy is being B, pragmatic. I have two options. One, I know to be effective. I'm going to use the effective option. I'm going to be pragmatic about this decision. Empiricism has to do with observation and data-driven decision-making. Lucy is not making, hasn't made any observations yet. She hasn't collected any data and yet she's still making a decision because she's being practical, she's being pragmatic. And selectionism has to do with behavior, persisting because of consequences. We're not sure how Lucy's behavior is going to change. We just know she made the pragmatic decision by making the practical choice to go with what is effective. A life coach is developing a plan for one of his clients that will lead to the client getting up earlier in the morning and spending less time on their phone. In order for this to be considered applied in terms of the dimensions of behavior analysis, what must be true? So let's think about this. We are looking at a dimension of behavior analysis, the applied dimension. And applied has to do with meaningful goals, meaningful change, things that matter, right? We're trying to choose things that matter. This life coach has a plan that's going to lead to the client getting up earlier and spending less time on their phone. Why or how do we make this apply? Well, this plan and this change needs to make a difference in this client's life. So let's look at A. The plan must reliably lead to the client getting up earlier and spending less time on their phone. A would be effective even if it isn't necessarily applied. B, the plan must be easily repeatable for others. That would have to do with technological. C, the plan must maintain and still take place if the client travels or stay somewhere else for the night. That has to do with generality. D, the plan must lead to a socially significant outcome for the client. Yes, that's what we're looking for. We want a plan that's applied, meaning we want socially significant, meaningful changes for our clients. We've done a lot of dimension and assumption questions so far. Notice, hopefully notice how precise you need to be, but how easy these can be if you are really, really fluent in your dimensions and assumptions. You move to a new state and have to register your car and get a new license. The DMV will accept a passport, a current license, or a birth certificate as proof of identification. These items would be considered what? We are looking at the items, and the question wants to know what the items would be considered. So when we're talking about items, not as a singular, but as a group, we're going to call that a class. So we have a situation where you have a passport, a license, and a certificate, all equal identification. They all serve the same purpose. What would they be considered? A, a stimulus. Well, again, we're looking at these items as a set, not necessarily individually. So we're looking at them as a class. So B, stimulus class, looks good. What about a response class? Well, these are not responses. They're stimuli. So we can't have a response class. And D, formal stimulus class. Well, the passport, the license, and the certificate don't necessarily share the same form or topography, but they're still 
serving the same function. They're still evoking the same response or serving the same purpose. So all of these items are going to be considered a stimulus class. While driving down the highway, Sarah thinks she hears a loud ambulance siren behind her, so she starts to pull over. About three years ago, Sarah received a ticket for not yielding to an emergency vehicle. What type of conditioning has Sarah's behavior undergone? All right, interesting question here, right? It's a conditioning question about Sarah's behavior. What do we know about Sarah's behavior? We know Sarah, as she, as she is driving down the highway, she thinks she hears a loud ambulance, which we can maybe call an antecedent. What does she do? She pulls over. Now, what is the consequence of pulling over? Well, we know three years ago, she got a ticket. So the consequence is avoiding the ticket. So if her behavior was conditioned through consequences, what do we call that? Well, we call that A, operant conditioning. Operant conditioning has to do with selection by consequences, right? Consequences influence future behavior. Respondent conditioning is our stimulus response relationship, right? Where we aren't so worried about the consequences and we're only more worried about the reflexes. This is consequence related. And then respondent extinction and operant extinction, we're not focused on the extinction. We're looking at the conditioning of Sarah's behavior. She's been conditioned to pull over when she hears loud sirens because of her learning history. A child is given a set of three identical pictures of a car and is asked to match each picture to itself without any additional training. The child correctly matches each picture to its identical pair. What property of stimulus, stimulus relations does this demonstrate? Question is asking about stimulus relations or stimulus equivalents. How are stimuli related? And through relations, we can form concepts. Response induction can occur. A lot of great things happen through stimulus equivalents and stimulus relations. This just happens to be the easiest type of relation because we have three identical pictures and the child is told to match each picture to its identical pair. So basically, what are we doing? We're matching A to A. When we matched A to A without learning, that's reflexivity. Symmetry is A to B in the inverse. And then transitivity is A equals B equals C equals A, right? All we have here is ID matching, identical matching, simple display of reflexivity. Lane is having lunch with Jackson at their favorite sandwich shop, which is very busy. Lane starts discussing one of their clients as they are both behavior technicians and on the client's team. Lane is describing personal details, including information about the family and the child. Jackson thinks Lane is talking quite loud. What might be a problem in this scenario? Okay, we're getting to an ethical question. And we have to think critically about ethics, but we also want to be very black and white on the exam with ethics, right? We want to be very by the book, letter of the law. In this case, what do we know? We know Lane and Jackson are eating lunch and they're talking about the client and they're on the client team. Not necessarily an issue, right? Two technicians or two people, maybe analysts, talking about their client that they share. The problem is they're at a busy sandwich shop. Lane is talking about personal details and Jackson thinks Lane is loud. So what is the issue? What might be the problem given the fact that Lane is discussing personal things quite loudly in a busy area? Hey, Lane should not discuss other clients with Jackson. Well, they're on the same team. They can talk about the client together. That is allowed. B, Lane should just talk quieter if he is going to discuss these details in public. He should be quieter, but really he shouldn't talk about client personal details at all. That shouldn't be discussed in public. C, Jackson and Lane should not be hanging out outside of work. There's nothing against hanging out with your coworkers. D, Lane should not discuss clients in public. Yeah, we want to be by the book. And we should not be discussing personal information about clients in public, no matter if you don't think someone's listening or not. You never know who is around, who can hear what. And if you're discussing personal details in public, especially in a loud fashion, that's a problem. So what is the issue? Lane should not discuss clients in public. The most desirable section at Sullivan's Steakhouse is the section with the larger tables and better views as tips are typically better in that section. 
The standard procedure is to give the worst section with the lowest tips to the waiter that serves up late that day. This has proven to reduce lateness in the past. What has led to reduced lateness? Well, it's a behavior question and a consequence question. We know lateness has reduced. We always want to ask ourselves, how did the behavior change? In this case, lateness has gone down because it's been punished. And so what is that consequence? Well, whatever waiter serves up late that day is going to get the worst section, which typically leads to the lowest tips. So they're given the worst section. They're added, right? That is added to the environment. That is a positive punishment. So A, or what has led to reduced lateness? A, extinction. Well, the behavior isn't on extinction, right? If you're late, you're going to get the worst section. We are going to punish you with the worst section by B, positively punishing you. We're giving you the worst section. C, negative punishment. They're not being taken away. Nothing's being removed, but you are being given a bad section. And then D, negative reinforcement. Well, it can't be reinforcement because that behavior is decreasing. So what has proven to reduce lateness in the past? B, positive punishment. Mr. Kelso introduces a good behavior game into his classroom. His students take to it immediately, and Mr. Kelso sees a 40% reduction in challenging behavior after just two weeks. The game is easy to implement, so he shows the science teacher who is able to implement the game but chooses not to, and the behavior change does not occur in science class. What dimension is missing in the scenario? All right, another dimension question. Let's be precise. We're looking at the dimension that is missing, so it's a little different, right? What is missing in this scenario? Well, let's, let's think here, right? We have Mr. Kelso, who introduces the behavior game in the classroom. Students take to it immediately, and he sees a reduction, a 40% reduction in just two weeks. So it seems that he's been effective. So if we look at B, effective, seems to be present. The game is easy to implement, so he shows a science teacher who is able to implement the game. So if somebody else can implement the game that he designed, it is technological. But the science teacher chooses not to, and the behavior change does not occur in science class. So now we have generality and conceptually systematic. Well, the good behavior game is based on ABA principles. So Mr. Kelso is being conceptually systematic. What has not occurred is generality, because the behavior change does not generalize to science class. What dimension is missing here is generality. A college student earns points through her university when she engages in certain activities or participates in events on campus. These points are usable for meals in the student union or for items from the student bookstore. The points are most accurately considered what? Think about these points as tokens, right? You are getting points for activities and events. So you do a behavior, you get points. If you do a behavior, you get tokens. And those tokens are considered what? Well, tokens are generalized condition reinforcers. Why? Well, they, begin, they can be used in a lot of situations for a lot of behaviors. In this case, points, they can be used for meals, items. They are very generalized. So what are the points considered? A, unconditioned reinforcers. Well, they're not unconditioned because those points had to be conditioned through pairing with other reinforcement. B, conditioned reinforcers. They are conditioned, but more specifically, they are C, generalized condition reinforcers, because they have a lot of uses in a lot of settings. And then D, automatic reinforcers. Well, you've got to exchange these points, so it's not automatic. It's going to be socially mediated. Points are most accurately considered generalized condition reinforcers. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, Cammie works a double shift at the hospital. Her supervisor in the morning is constantly praising Cammie for doing her job while our afternoon supervisor provides significantly less praise for the same behaviors. What type of schedule is this? When we have two schedules operating for one behavior, what do we call that? Because in this case, we have a situation, Cami works a double shift, morning supervisor, constant praise. Let's just say FR2. Afternoon, lot less praise. Let's just call it an FR10. Two different schedules operating on the same behavior, and there is an SD signaling which one is available, right? The morning is here, afternoon is here. So we have a compound schedule, two schedules alternating or rotating or randomly changing. 
with SDs as signal, the availability of that schedule, what do we call that? A, chain. Well, chain, we have to execute or complete basic schedules in a certain order. It's not what's happening here, right? We either have a mix or a multiple schedule. And since there are SDs signaling the availability, it's going to be multiple. Multiple schedules are operating for the same behavior. Concurrent. Concurrent, the difference is with concurrent, we've got two behaviors on two different schedules, and there's choice involved. There's no choice involved here. It just depends on who's available with what supervisor who's going to give what type of reinforcement on a certain type of schedule. So the answer here is multiple. Thanks for watching. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. Please subscribe, like, and share. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.